Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Today we begin by looking at some ongoing research that uses wheat pasture as a supplement to winter feeding. Here's our extension beef cattle specialist, Dave Lohman. In this experiment, what we've got, Lindell, is uh, one set of cows that are managed more traditionally with a low stocking rate on native pasture. We have three replications or three pastures of those cows, and they're fall calving cows. And in, in uh, the intensive group, more intensively managed group, we have uh, cows that are limit grazing wheat through the winter. And then once we get past first hollow stem, we just turn them out and let them graze the wheat out. And the plan is for that group of cows or that treatment to go to native pasture and then come back later in the summer and graze the same acre of wheat, uh, uh, a cover crop. So that's the intensive system. How long are these cows out here grazing and how do you measure how much they're actually eating? They graze the wheat uh, four hours a day, three days a week. And of course, the wheat is a really good complement to the low quality prairie hay because it runs, say, four to 5% protein. The wheat's 20 to 25%. So we kind of thought that that three times a week might meet the protein requirement and supply some additional energy supplementation as well. And talk about the science that goes into really measuring how much they've consumed when they've been out in the pasture here. That's one of the most difficult things in grazing research is measuring forage consumption. Uh, you just can't, you can't chase the cow around with a scale. And so what we, what we decided to try for this project was before we turn the cows out at noon, uh, the, the students weigh, and we only, we've only done two cows per day, okay, and you'll understand why as I describe it, but um, weigh the cows, turn them out at about noon and then after four hours they weigh the cow back again so you would think that her body weight would go up as she consumes wheat forage but the tricky part of that is is that we, we all sometimes those cows will defecate during that time period and so the graduate students monitored the cows the whole time and anytime a cow defecated they with the rubber gloves and the plastic bag they go pick that up put it in the bag, identify it to that cow, and then we'd weigh that as well so that we knew exactly um, how much forage they consumed. The last little piece of, of, of calculating dry matter consumption is figuring out how much dry matter is in the wheat because there's a lot of moisture in that forage. And so right after the cows were brought in and weighed the second time, they'd come back out to the pasture and clip some forage, take it to the ovens, and determine the dry matter content. So there's some paying their dues in the name of science, they if you are. will. They've worked hard, and that's a, that's kind of a long four hours waiting for a cow for the event to occur in a cow. But they've they've done a good job, and it's worked really well. And now you're able to really actually see the results between the different groups. Talk about that. So far, uh, the, one interesting thing is that in that four hour period, those cows are consuming these cows on the wheat. Uh, treatment or the intensive treatment are consuming about 16 pounds of wheat dry matter. That's a lot. We didn't expect that they would be able to consume that much. Uh, so the overall results through the wintering phase thus far is uh, the cows on the limit grazed wheat weigh about 100 pounds more than the cows on native pasture and 3 pounds of 40 percent cubes, okay, the extensive treatment. They're about a body condition score and a half higher, in other words, fleshier. And the calves on the limit grazing wheat up to this point weigh about 60 pounds more. So pretty significant, it sounds like. Pretty significant. And now, as you can see, we've turned them out for the graze out period. And that difference in calf weights is going to continue to, to grow. So what happens next? You're going to continue with this study. You have some other things planned? We do. The... Um, these cows will go to native pasture after graze out, just like the extensive group of cows. And then we'll wean all of the calves in July and they'll go to the feed yard and we intend to track feed yard performance, feed efficiency, uh, and also look at carcass quality to see if that higher weaning weight in the intensive cattle group uh, carries through. Very interesting research. Dave Lawman, our Extension Beef Cattle Specialist, keep us posted. We want to know how it goes. Will do. Thank you for coming out.
Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. It seems like we wait a long time for rain. Then when the rain comes, the amounts are light. A map of last weekend's rain showed this pattern. Rain fell across most of the state, but out west it was common to see less than a quarter inch. In central Oklahoma, there was a little more. Rain amounts were close to a half inch. In the southeast, there were some scattered bands slightly above an inch. A map of rainfall since April 1st shows the same pattern. In the heavier bands, the rain collected for April has been close to two inches. The highest was at Durant, two and 14 hundredths. Soils are warming. The three-day average for four inches under bare soil on April 9th was in the mid-50s across most of Oklahoma. A burning index map from Wednesday afternoon, April 9th, was filled with bright red and orange indicating high fire danger. The major wheat growing areas showed up on this map as a wide green and yellow band from Altus to Hinton to Enid. There were five counties with active county burn bans as of April 9th, Alfalfa, Cimarron, Craig, Custer, and Roger Mills. Here's Gary with a long-term look at our current drought conditions. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everybody. As Al told you, we did get some decent rainfall, especially in the southeastern parts of the state last week. So let's take a look at the latest U.S. Drought Monitor map and see how things changed. Down in southeastern Oklahoma, you can see a little bit more of that white area where all the abnormally dry conditions have been removed. We even lost a little of that D1 moderate drought. But then you look up farther to the northwest and you can see that severe D2 drought did expand up into northeastern Oklahoma. And farther to the west, you can see that D4 exceptional drought now covers much of the entire far western part of the state, uh, all the way up into the southern Harper County area, and then over into the southern Beaver and Texas counties. Up in the Panhandle, Goodwell comes in with the lowest amount at 37.1 inches over that 42 month period, plus a few days. And the Oklahoma Mesonet site down in Mount Hermon came in with 163.2 inches. So a huge difference between the two corners of the state. And you look at that departure from normal rainfall map from that same time period, you can see most of the state is from 30 to more than 40 inches below normal, and other areas are at least 10 percent below normal to more than 20 percent below normal. We've seen that Altus is more than 50 inches below normal over that time period. So that's your drought in a nutshell right there, 42 months of drought as portrayed by the Oklahoma Mesonet. Now here's a table for the rainfall statistics for each climate division over that period. A little bit different format. You can see statewide average of about 94 inches, about 31 inches below normal, uh, about 75 percent of normal, and the rest of the areas of the state are in that range somewhere. Um, these are over larger areas. Southwest Oklahoma, uh, an aerial average of about 69.3 inches, about 35 inches below normal. Uh, and that's really what you see across the state. And that's what you're going to see continue unless we start to get good amounts of rainfall uh, this spring and then into the summer months. So we are in the warm season. This is a time when that drought can really start to take off. So this is a time we really need that rainfall. So continue to hope for rain, pray for rain, and hopefully we'll have better news for you next week. That's it for this week. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Today we're going to look at a category I like to call ID tools. Uh, several apps within this category, several very useful apps as a matter of fact. A few of them that I'd really like to point out, uh, the first and foremost for me is weed identification tools. Not being a weed scientist, I, I don't have a great ability to go out there and identify weeds on a very regular basis. So a nice tool, one comes from the University of Missouri called ID Weeds. This is the first app that actually came out where you could drop down identify morphologically a weed. So it's a very clean tool. You can identify, you choose plant type, whether it's a broadleaf or a grass and then you select the habitat, the leaf arrangement, and it gives you options of what weed it may be. Another very, very nice app when it comes to weed identification tools comes from BASF, it's Weed ID. Very similar to the Missouri app that you can select options to find your weed. 
The one difference in this app is it uses images, not just text. In this case, you can see you choose a grass, choose the options of a folded, uh, all options, and a long ligule length. We show plants. In this case, it gives us the option of coxfoot. Another very nice tool that I utilize quite a bit, especially being a soil fertility guy, is the IPNI's Plant Images. IPNI is the International Plant Nutrition Institute. Their Plant Images is just a collection of pictures of plants with nutrient deficiencies. Uh, very handy to use. They do not have an identification tool, but you can look at what different deficiencies look like on one crop. So if we select canola, we can see what boron deficiency looks like has some nice pictures of boron deficient canola plants, iron deficiency, and they have a very nice selection of crops and nutrients with a significant amount of images in all of them. On plant images, there is an option to go into symptomology. So if we're to select boron, it'll tell you where on the plant the symptoms occur and what you can look for in each of the plant species. The plant images is one of the few apps that I've actually paid for. It will cost a little bit of money, but if you are crop consulting or in fields quite often looking at plants, trying to diagnose problems, it's a very handy tool to have. The final app that I like to use is Pestbook. It is, a, it is an app that has images only and names of insects. It is not an identification tool, but it does allow you to look at insects and see images of them such as armyworm, it gives you the life cycle, it gives you the size. What should be noted on this app is it is Australian. This is not an American app. However, it's still quite useful as many as the insects trans transfer across, such as a caught worm, the cut worm, the uh, mealy bug, and other insects. So the pest book is one of those apps that does not give you an opportunity to go through there and select different morphological features to figure out what kind of insect you have. Although it is still a very nice tool to have that you can show somebody the images of what to look for. If you tell an employee to be on the lookout for armyworm, you can go in, show them a picture of armyworm, and they know what to look for. To read more about these apps and others, see my blog at sunup.okstate.edu. The estimates in beef cattle are that about a half of 1% of all birthings that takes place will be multiple births. That means about one in every 200 we'd expect to be twins. The incidence in dairy cattle, by the way, is, is actually even much higher. The reason that I bring this up during this calving season is to remind producers that when they have a set of twins and one of them's a heifer and one of them's a bull calf, they need to mark in, in their herd book or the ear tag of that heifer so that they don't save her back for a replacement. This is called a free martin. And what's taking place during the gestation of those twin calves, the bull calf will develop a little sooner than will the heifer calf. And with the blood exchange that we have between the fetuses and the dam, there will be some exchange of the reproductive hormones coming from that bull fetus that affect the development of the reproductive tract of the female fetus. And when she's born, then most of the time, those heifers are totally infertile. The, the data says that it's well over 95% of heifers born twin to bulls will never be able to reproduce. So that's why we want to mark them down, make certain that we don't save back replacement heifers that were born twin to a bull and then end up uh, feeding and growing out a heifer that has no chance to ever reproduce and be a, a productive cow in our herd. Keep that in mind and, and we can certainly save some dollars in the long run. We look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner.
Earlier this week, the WASDE report came out, and we have Kim Anderson here to kind of give us a recap of the report. Was there any great news in it? Not much news at all. You had uh, wheat ending stocks uh, slightly higher, but it was right, in, right along with market expectation. You had car corn stocks lower. The market expected them to go down. Not quite as much as they did. Soybean stocks were lower as expected. Okay, what are you hearing as far as wheat forward contracted prices? Well, if you look at harvest delivered wheat, uh, the uh, basis is running about 40 cents below the July contract price. You have that contract price around 740, so you can forward contract harvest delivered wheat for around seven dollars. Okay, now let's let's look at another summer crop here in Oklahoma, canola. Uh, canola, you can forward contract that for somewhere around oh nine dollars to nine dollars and thirty five cents, depending on where you are in the state. Producers want to watch a forward contract or a futures contract on that. They can look at the Winnipeg Exchange for the canola contract. Look at that July. I subtract uh, anywhere from a dollar sixty to a dollar ninety below, off of that contract price. You'll be pretty close to what the market's offering. Okay. Although there's no corn or very little corn planted in Oklahoma right now, let's look at some forward contracts contracting prices on corn? Well, uh, uh, corn is based on the December contract for forward contracts. Uh, you know, around 33 under that for the uh, forward contract prices. That's in central Oklahoma. At the Panhandle, uh, Texas and Oklahoma, it's 10 to 15 cents above that contract mm -hmm. price. That price is around five dollars. That gives you about 465 to 470 in central Oklahoma, around 510 to 515 in Texas Panhandle or Oklahoma Panhandle. And of course, sorghum. Sorghum uh, is about oh, 45 50 cents below the December contract, uh, not quite as good a price as uh, corn, maybe 10 or 15 lower than that. So you got around $4.50 for forward contract for sorghum. Okay, let's not forget soybeans. What are you seeing in soybeans? Oh, the soybean uh, November December contracts around 12 and a quarter. The basis in Oklahoma is about 75 cents below that. So around $11.50 for harvest delivered beans. Okay, one of my favorite questions this time of year, Kim, what will the price of wheat be uh, June 15th in Kingfisher, Oklahoma? Uh, at six dollars and fifty cents unless it rains if it rains it's going to be six and a quarter if it doesn't rain let's go up to seven wow it's quite a quite a jump there okay kim anderson grain marketing specialist here at oklahoma state university hi welcome to shop stop today we want to talk a little bit about uh, electrical cords and knowing the difference between the neutral and the hot wire in that cord so yeah, you typically have, have three wires. Some cords will have just two, and they would be the, the hot, what we'd call hot, and what we'd call neutral. And then you'd have, on a three wire, you'd have a, have a ground for 110 circuit. But the deal is, is, is typically, you know, on our, our neutral and our hot wires are gonna be either a white or a black, typically. And how do you tell if they're not, uh, if they're not marked with the yes. colors? So some cords are like this, that they're just, uh, you just have, when you strip it down you have the same color but the way you can tell is that they have some type of identifier sometimes it will be it'll have some type of identifier on the on the neutral to locate it and it'll be ribs most typically and you can identify that as your neutral and if you get confused you can always look at your plug you've got the the large one and that's where your neutral is and that's where your neutral prong will, will connect to, and that will identify it as well. So, if you're gonna wire your uh, rewired dishwasher or something, you've got a cord that does not have the, the colors marked on it, uh, you know, try to identify which is which so you get it wired correctly. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Shop Stop. Tax season is drawing to an end, and with it, there's an opportunity. With all that information gathered up, it's a good time to gather the family and talk about farm transitions. To help us out with that topic, Shannon Farrell, our Ag Loss Specialist. Now, Shannon, this really is a good time when you've got all that data together to kind of sit down and get an idea of what that inventory is for your farm. Well, you're absolutely right, because when you're trying to figure out what your farm is going to look like in the future, whether you're talking about a few years from now or you're talking about with the next generation, 
you got to start with an inventory because like we say you can't manage what you can't measure so getting that inventory together is good for a couple of reasons number one it'll give you a good idea of what assets that you're going to be dealing with in this plan and number two it naturally gets you thinking about what do i want to have happen with this land or this equipment and so it begins that process and by the way when you go talk to a professional your accountant or your lawyer the first thing they're going to tell you to do is create an inventory anyway so you might as well get the process started yourself all right so once you have that inventory what next? Group objectives, maybe? Right, because now that you're thinking about having a farm transition plan, you need to establish what those objectives are going to be. Because those objectives then are going to drive the tools that you're going to need to select to make that plan a reality. So you need to think about things like, are you going to have enough retirement income to make sure that you can have a quality of life that you want un until you pass away? And how much of the business do you want to keep intact for the next generation to step into, if indeed the next generation does want to come back to the farm and operate it as a, as a going business? So all this sounds like we need as a family to have a lot of really open communication, something a lot of us aren't real good at as a family. Right. You've, you've got to have the talk. And the reason for that is that we see so many farms that struggle with this transition process just because there is no communication. The next generation doesn't know what the expectations of the founding generation are. And lots of times we see people that are coming back to the farm just because they think mom and dad want them to when really they've never talked about it if they wanted to come back to the farm. Um, at the same time, there's lots of miscommunications that can lead to, you know, missed opportunities. So you really just need to sit down with your family and have an open, honest discussion where everybody can feel like they've had their chance to have a say and really talk about what's important to them when it comes to the future of the operation. Okay. At what point do you bring in a professional? Well, once you've looked at that inventory, you know, and now you've set some objectives for yourself and you've talked to your family and determined what their objectives and their values are, now you're in a really good position to say, okay, these are the business objectives that we need to achieve. How do we go about doing that best? And that's the ideal time to start talking to your tax professional, to your accountant, and to your attorney to figure out what the nuts and bolts transactionally are going to be to get your operation from where it is to where you want to go. All right, so now we've kind of just barely scratched on the surface of this. There's a lot more to dig into, and you've got some opportunities coming up for folks to, if they really want to dig into this with yourself and your peers here at Oklahoma State, Tell us about those. Absolutely. We're really excited to have some grant funding from the USDA's Risk Management Agency and some partnerships that we've established with Farm Credit and the Noble Foundation. And we're doing, through that funding, a series of farm transition workshops. And the next workshop that's available for people to sign up is on Friday, May 2nd. It's going to be here on campus at the West Watkins Center. A day-long workshop where we're going to talk about inventory, family communications, what are some of the tools that you can use to transition your farm to the next generation, and then how do you really integrate all the generations as part of that planning process. So that's the first step in that approach. And then for people that have participated in our one-day events, then later in the summer, probably going to be uh, early August, we're working on scheduling an intensive two-day workshop where we'll talk in more depth about those topics and we'll have accountants, mediators, and lawyers available for you to ask your questions and you can come have the talk here in a neutral environment where everybody can, can really get their feelings out there and really start making some steps towards the future. All right, very good. And if you'd like to know more about those workshops, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Drip torch is one of the most essential tools that we have for lighting a prescribed burn. A drip torch is just an aluminum container, holds about a gallon and a half of fuel. The fuel that you use in this drip torch is, to, is a mixture of gasoline and diesel. So what you're going to do is you're going to undo this lock ring on top, set it down, and then this is a the spout knob. You're going to take it off and it's got a spot right over here next to it where you can put it in here to keep it from setting loose. And all you're going to do is pull it out and flip it straight over. And when you do that, you'll notice this curly cue in the spout and the handle. You want the curly cue facing away from the handle. And then you're going to take the lock ring, place it over the top of that. And all you need to do is snug these things up. They've got rubber gaskets to help seal it. And then once you get down, then right above the handle, there's a vent. And you need to open it up after three quarters of a turn, get a vent to get the thing started to run. All right, so now we've got it set up. We're ready to start our fire. We don't have anything set right now. So we've got a lighter fire. One of the best ways to do it 
go ahead and just tip it over. It just works by gravity. Put a little bit of fuel out, of torch fuel out on some grass or some other fuel. You're going to take your lighter. You're going to light it. Make sure you have your gloves on. You need to operate. You set it up with your gloves off, but you're going to operate it with your gloves on. Everything else you do with it. So all you have to do is bend down, stick it in there. This wick, make sure it's got fuel in it, and that's what holds your fire. And then all you have to do is tilt it down, and you can see the fuel dripping off. And you want it just dripping off that wick and lighting. And you just hold it at a down angle, and then you can walk, lighting a string of fire as you go. If you are, if you are going to stop burning for any short period of time, the best thing to do is, is to put it out. And there's three ways that you can put, this, put a torch out. One of them is you can take your gloved hand and wrap it around the wick and smother the fire that way. The other way is, is you can you can blow it out. One thing you need to be careful about blowing it out is coming back, especially if you have facial hair and you like it, you may lose it if you're not careful. Finally, the other way is just a combination of both of them where you grab it and blow and put it out. Drip torches are one of the, the, the easiest and the best method of lighting fires. Very safe to operate. If you just remember just a few little things about keeping everything safe. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube and other social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at Sunup.